Welcome to Herbally Yours, an adventure into the world of natural medicine. Here is your host, Dr. Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse who will help you take the leap to ultimate wellness. Greetings and thank you for joining me, Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, for another edition of Herbally Yours right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Herbally Yours brings you the latest information about the many facets in the world of natural living. Today, I am so pleased to have as our guest, Kat Mayer. Kat is a registered herbalist and founding director of Sacred Plant Traditions, a center for herbal studies in Charlottesville, Virginia. She's been in clinical practice for over 30 years and teaches internationally at universities, conferences, and herbal schools. She began her studies of plants as a Peace Corps volunteer. And with her training as a physician's assistant, it allows her to weave the language of biomedicine into her practice of traditional energetic herbalism. She is a founding member of Botanica Mobile Clinic, a nonprofit dedicated to providing accessible herbal medicine to local communities and has served as the president of United Plant Savers. Today, we're going to be discussing her brand new beautiful book, called Energetic Herbalism, A Guide to Sacred Plant Traditions, Integrating Elements of Vitalism, Ayurveda, and Chinese Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kat. Well, thank you, Ellen. It's wonderful to be here. You have been an herbalist for a long time. Let's go back. I think that's really interesting. I did not know that you were in the Peace Corps. What led you to join the Peace Corps in the first place? So when I was 12, uh, I saw a movie on the Peace Corps. Actually, I was in high school and, you know, I always had a gravitation. I was raised a Catholic and I was enthralled with the stories of healing and there were no Jesus schools, but I just, you know, there, it was just this compelling uh, movement of, well, how, how do we work in healing? What is this? So I saw a movie uh, when I was 12 of the Peace Corps, and I realized, oh, this is it. So it sort of didn't matter what I studied in college. And interestingly enough, I sort of defaulted to a chemistry business major, which totally serves uh, my herbal practice in many ways. Um, so it was, I knew way back when that this was what I'm, I was going to do. Well, when you were traveling with the Peace Corps, did that bring you to any sort of indigenous knowledge um, with the groups that you were working with in the field? So I was in Chile and it was 1978. So if anyone's familiar with South American history, uh, that was the horrible years of Pinochet. And so the coup, uh, the Pinochet sponsored in part by U.S. interests, um, it was a really horrific time. And so that really affected the trust of a lot of the rural um, indigenous people uh, because they were well aware of different factions. And so I was in a small town uh, south of Santiago as a health and nutrition educator. So it actually took a good six months, um, you know, going to rural clinics and talking about very basic you know, hygiene and nutrition that they eventually uh, welcomed me in and that they would then take me on their plant gathering. Um, and so the indigenous in Chile, it's really interesting. It's mostly Mapuche. That's a word that means people of the earth. They are mostly in Southern Chile. So who I really you know, lived with and came to love and the Chileans are, you know, they may have taken a while to embrace me with their medicine, but immediately uh, they welcomed me um, into their homes. So it took a while to begin going out into the field, knowing the medicines, but it was really, there was a saying in Chile, no se Mapuche. And that's don't be a witch. And it was, um, it was very, um, malintent. And so they had to do everything sort of um, under the radar, if you will. Um, so it wasn't in the clinics, 
Chile was, they called it the country club of the Peace Corps because there was a lot of modern medicine and um, it really didn't have that deep, deep indigenous practice of say Bolivia or Peru or other countries. So it was such a fascinating uh, transition uh, and a place to really understand, oh, this is what's being gained with allopathy and modern medicine, and then this is what's being lost. Well, that's a fascinating story, and I'd like to remind our listeners that you are listening to Herbally Yours on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse, and my guest today is herbalist Kat Mayer, and we're going to be talking about her beautiful new book, Energetic Herbalism, a guide to sacred plant traditions, integrating elements of vitalism, Ayurveda, and Chinese medicine. You know, Kat, I got a review copy of the book. I'm not sure if is it out yet. Is it out yet where people can actually grab it? Yes. It's good. been out for a couple of weeks. So, right. So, barely new, you know, and, and we're doing our show today because looking through it, I found it is incredibly comprehensive. And I do want to say for us herbalists, I know not everybody listening is an herbalist, but the whole term energetic medicine and energetic herbalism, although it's steeped in ancient tradition, is also coming forward as a very important topic because, like you said, it's deeply rooted, and you talk about it in depth in your book, in terms of the ancient traditions of Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. Vitalism is more of a really Western concept that also incorporates, but we're finding that as people are now coming on board and becoming herbalists, um, if anybody's interested, they can always contact me because we have courses of moving forward to become an herbalist, that that concept of energetic herbalism is so important. And people are looking for resources about it. So you just tell us, why did you decide to write this book? Well, it actually started out as my three-year curriculum. And I have a three-year clinical curriculum, a course here at Sacred Plant Traditions. And this is everything that I really believe that an herbalist, it will really serve them to have these teachings in their medicine bag, so to speak. And moving forward, you know, I was trained as a physician assistant. I totally love allopathy. I'm a recovering scientist. I just love glutathione pathways. You know, I love how the sacred energetic traditions really um, explain, you know, the science and that it's much more intuitive. And I can go into that more later. But so this essentially was going to be a textbook for my course And then the evolution, you know, my editor and I stepped back and I thought, you know, this is, this is a manual. This is a manual that every family, anyone that really wants to work deeply, you know, it's not a beautiful coffee table book and there's so many beautiful herbals out there for beginners, but I did write this with a beginner in mind, um, because it's more of an invitation. And it's an invitation to understand, you know, Chinese, Ayurvedic, they aren't intimidating when you realize all of them are talking about the elements of the earth. They're talking about fire. They're talking about water. And same thing with vitalism, which is based in Greek medicine. So I really wanted to distill down to the very basics. We can think about this. This is intuitive. We know when we're running hot or we're running cold. And so how do we navigate our own personal health And then how as practitioners can we then go deeper into our practice? And a lot of it, like you said, is simple. Like if you think about a joint that's very hot, so that's hot. So you might want to do something that would help it cool. You know, that's like a a simple concept. But I find in Western herbal medicine versus Chinese and Ayurveda, it really is not, has not been discussed as much in terms of paying attention to that energetic balance, which I think you're bringing forth in this book and which all herbalists now who are studying, you know, need to understand because it's so important in terms of really helping the system bring the system back into balance. 
Exactly. You know, there's many different levels, but and there's many impetuses for the book. But for me, the main conversation right now is climate change. And what I really feel energetic herbalism really addresses is streamlining our choices, our practices, and the earth is warming, we're warming. How do we cool our bodies? What are the refrigerants in herbal medicine? It's called refrigerants, herbs that cool the body, whether that's hibiscus, whether it's foods like watermelon. So it's a way of going forward uh, with definite tools. You know, if there's more water, how do we move damp and how do we warm the system? Uh, So it's, you know, there's a whole behind the scenes um, and the plants I choose You know, the 25 Materia Medica, they're primarily uh, the weeds. I call them the colonizer plants because you can find plantain, you can find dandelion all across the different bioregions of America. So we really, as herbalists, I'm really making the plea. It's time. It's time that we're not working with plants from South Africa or the Caucasus Mountains, or if we do have these special medicines, that we treat them as very special and that we don't make, you know, international orders the standards of the day. We really begin to come closer to home. um, And it's also so much more affordable. Which really, all herbalists around the world, and I have lived in very remote areas for years on end in a grass shack with no running water and no electricity, and that was in southern Mexico, but I have found this repeated in many places. I also do that on the north coast of Jamaica, where the local herbalists really sometimes use like four or five plants for everything, yet they may collect one plant I'm thinking of. They collected this bark by grabbing it and pulling it down in the evening if they wanted to use it to really as a laxative. And that same plant, they would grab at the bottom and pull up in the morning, and they would use that as an emetic if someone ate something that poisoned themselves. And then when I saw it actually working way later on, I realized how important the energetics are. But to bring in the science, when we, and I took the, I took those samples to a specific laboratory in Jamaica, natural product laboratory. And when they analyzed them, they did have different chemical compositions. Oh my God. Well, talk about energetic herbalism, Ellen. That is such an amazing, Amazing story. I love that. It's true, but it also talks about the fact what you brought up that many herbalists just use what's local. They're not, I mean, for out throughout time, they're not ordering something from far away. Yeah. So that's how you chose the 25 that are highlighted. Of course, throughout the book, you talk about many other plants and you talk about many different traditions. And you have this book is really fantastic for anyone to have on their shelf because you talk about the actual scientific basis of a lot of those traditions. Like people can learn about the earth, air, fire, and water, what's being analyzed in Chinese medicine, how that relates to what what was also discussed in Ayurveda. So there's a lot in this book. You're right. It's really like a textbook. And, you know, the words that I was, when I was redesigning it and rethinking it and making it less academic, less clinical, you know, the word Ellen and I kept coming up with was, you know, the invitation to the senses because the energetic is senses. Now, that incredible story about the bark you know, there's directions. There are herbs that bring a downward direction in our body. So how phenomenal that the bark moving up, you know, uh, emetics or, or, you know, the whole process of emesis or vomiting, that that's an upward movement and, you know, downward. So that's, that's senses, that's, and it's not always that black and white, but, you know, once we really understand, oh, this rosemary, this thyme, this is moving, this is pungent, you know, that's why it's on our digestive spice rack. So if we may not have a certain herb, we can start thinking of, well, gosh, if I don't have ginger, what's the energetics of? Well, maybe I use a little cayenne. I need to warm something. So it really gives us a latitude as far as, um, you know, what we can use and apply. So the whole That's idea- so true. And you call it medicine of place. 
So the medicine of place is that, and then it's also, this is sort of becoming my, my new favorite topic. You know, the medicine of place, I really believe that the, the constituents of the land of where the plant is harvested, that's the beginning of the apothecary. And so that's why bioregionalism or, you know, J.R. Worsley, who brought five phase theory, you know, out to the Western world, he said the plants within a 50 mile radius of where you live and you can be renting, you know, where your body is, those herbs 50 miles have the greatest potency. So medicine a place is one where are you harvesting and the other is to begin to look at the planet, you know, the earth will choose and select and certain plants will go to wounded areas and will go to places of war, will go to places of conflict. They've looked at Normandy and the plants that came in after that epic you know here i live in virginia and civil war is wrought everywhere the fields in these battlefields of saint john's wort and yarrow we're just observing you know we're just observing are these plants these plants have energy and spirits that not only address us but they address the planet so medicine of places you know, to help us not be so anthropocentric to think, oh, all these plants are here for us. You know, they're incredibly generous after everything we've been doing in the planet. They're still showing up with very potent medicine. And this is the chapter that I'm saying, well, let's plant the botanical sanctuaries. Let's really work on that reciprocity that Robin Wall Kimmer is talking about. So the medicine of places, let's think about you know, where are we harvesting? Well, you talked about two plants. So let's go more deeply into those. And that's something I have often observed in terms of St. John's wort, hypericum, is just this incredible plant because the where it grows exactly, it, it repeats itself. It seems it recedes and it comes back, not really perennial, perennial, but it recedes in those areas. But it also definitely seems to grow more during those times when there's more stress in the world. Well, you know, it's interesting. A great friend and teacher of mine is Phyllis Light. And years and years ago, she came to our school and she said, you know, as herbalists or as anyone, you know, that's why staying local, you observe, you observe the comings and goings of different plants, whether you know the names of them or not. So what she said is always be mindful and watch what plants are particularly prolific. If there's a lot of mullein that year, then harvest that because that's what will be needed. If there's a lot of sumac berries. And so the same thing with hypericum, uh, which is a profound um, healer of the nerves, healer of, uh, uh, you know, our spirit, our, our mental health. Um, so, yes, there's definitely that relationship, you know, that medicine of place. And you talk about a lot of different aspects of herbal medicine. And, of course, you have been studying all of these for so long. And one of the things you talk about is the spirit of plants themselves. Mm. And that's not so much, let's say, a, a physician's assistant topic, <laughs> you know, although yes and no, but it's more not so much that Western didactic knowledge, which you have tons of, but it's more the energetic essence, which really is what your book is about. Mm. You know, it's so funny. I'm just realizing as you're saying this, you know, that's sort of where I started hearing stories of Jesus and healing. You know, I kind of started on the spirit level and then traveled, you know, 40 years. And here I am in some ways coming full circle. And I feel that there's many great writings and you can call the spirit of the plant, the energetic. There's so many more writings that these 
trees, the mycelia, you know, all the research, you know, the scientific research is coming out that, you know, these trees are communicated through the roots and, and looking at all the mushrooms. These are sentient beings and they have an intelligence that is different than ours. You know, I don't know if they have emotions like we have, yet they have this incredible um, intelligence and the beautiful thing is when you're working with these plants is, yes, we take them for the constituents and, you know, the, there's so many languages within these plants, but the beauty of energetics or spirit medicine is they have a pattern to them. And so these plants have a pattern and when we take them in, they bring their pattern within us. And after a while of taking it, we don't need it anymore because we've taken on that pattern. And let me give you an example. So there's Solomon seal root and my teacher, Karen Sanders is Choctaw. And she says, Solomon seal helps us make 90 degree changes. And so we take this and if you dig up Solomon seal, it's a 90 degree root. And that's the doctrine of signatures and it's that pattern it holds. So if we need to make a change, and we know that takes a tremendous amount of courage, by taking Solomon seal, the spirit of that plant helps kind of bushwhack, you know, making this change. And it takes, it's not magical, it doesn't happen overnight, we have to show up as well. But this is that collaborative process that working with the spirit, working with our intention and our, our commitment. You know, it's a lot of work, you know, health and healing. Um, so there's so many different levels um, of the spirit. And I give a very simple example of how to work with spirit, you know, a technique um, in the book. And, you know, it, it can be very elaborate, um, but I really feel that it's relational. This is our relationship. And if you look at children, children are already looking Looking at the spirit, the joy and the delight. So it's kind of like taking on that childlike being. Right. You stay open to it. And I find plants very communicative. And one yeah. thing I, I have often done over the years is I will take one herb that I read about or like what you you just mentioned, let's say Solomon seal, whatever herb I hear about and get interested in, even if it's not one that I may need for a physical change of any kind, I will use that herb, a small amount of it for about a week. And what I have found then is when I'm interacting with someone else who needs that plant in the future, even 20 years later, even 40 years later, because I've been doing this since 1964, that plant suddenly comes back to me just in my mind. Yes. And yes. so there's a vibe with that individual who might really benefit from it. So it's very, very interesting. Yeah. And it's relational. Like you showed up for a week. You know that plan, that plan is part of you. And so it, it's like a, a, a trigger, it's like a memory um, th that's evoked for that person. That's beautiful. So there's so much to herbalism. It's really, there are chemical constituents as your physician's assistant part and, and uh, biomedical trained individual know, but that's such a small part of the story. And that's one of the reasons I kind of love energy medicine in terms of the planet and in terms of not using up all the plants. Have you ever seen this happen where you teach a class about a local plant and the next day it's all gone? Because all your students run out and grab it all? Well, you know, it's so funny because I have this magical story in the introduction of meeting the fir my first spirit introduction, really, and it's Black Cohosh. And I thought about that. I thought, wow. And then I, I revisit Black Cohosh through another amazing story. And here I'm writing about this profound life-changing event, but it's not in my Materia Medica because it's over harvested the tons and tons and tons of cohosh that's going out on the black market is astounding and appalling so part of me you know how can you write about american herbalism without talking about ginseng but why you know talk about the great parts of ginseng when in the next page i'm going to say but we can't use it 
So that was that was a challenge, you know, and choosing, gosh, 25 plants. Try that sometime, Alan. Right, but, you know, when you're looking at things like dandelion, they're not at all endangered. But I have seen that happen where people go, oh, really? And they go out, even the people in the class. I'm thinking, in fact, in terms of noni. When I was teaching about noni to a group of Jamaican pharmacists, and the next day there was not one noni on any tree in the area that we were having the classes in. Well, you know, obviously I felt like I failed um, in terms of really promoting the importance of conservation as well. So it's, it's a complex thing. Well, when you're making a drug, you can just make more. When you're looking at plants, if it's all gone in your area, not so easy. I know. And well, that's just a, a teaching for you. We, You and I have had many of them in our teaching career. But the other thing I'd say is I would ask them, have you figured out a recipe to make it palatable? Because, you know, I adore noni and, you know, it, it has a very distinctive flavor. But yeah, it's like, why all these superfoods? You know, I grew moringa this year. It's not going to win her over. But our food supply is greatly impacted right now. We, we think, oh, we're going to have a food shortage. We're, we're there. You know, we're already in what we keep thinking is coming. So I love the fact that, you know, moringa grows in your area. It grows in the south. But that's such an incredible, sustainable crop. It is. That thing just sprouts up in Florida. After you plant one, you're like, uh-oh, I got to cut it down. So it, so right. So it's exactly that. It, it spreads easily. It's not rare. And um, it's certainly something you want to have in your garden if you're in Florida. Virginia is like kind of borderline for it to grow, like you said, yeah. perhaps more as an annual. But just tell our listeners as we come to the end of our time together um, a little bit more about how they can find your book, Energetic Herbalism, just using those words. But the rest of it is a guide to sacred plant traditions, integrating elements of vitalism, Ayurveda, and Chinese medicine. I know it's funny, you know, I didn't pick the cover and I didn't choose the title. So it's always risky. And I'm just so incredibly grateful that Chelsea Green is such a stellar company and they did beautifully. But that's a lot of words in the subtitle. So I have a website for the book, katmeyerherbalism.com, M-A-I-E-R.com. And there are a lot of options for purchase. Um, You can purchase through me if you want a signed copy. You can go to Amazon if you do Amazon. There's independent booksellers um, that I love to support as well. Um, Thank you, Kat. We actually at our our end time, but I do want to let you know that um, once the show is archived, after people are listening live, we do have a link right to your website, capmyherbalism.com. So if you guys aren't writing it down, um, don't worry, it's right there for you. And thank you so much for being our guest today. Ellen, thank you. And I can't wait till conferences come back online and we can be together. (laughs) Yeah, instead of online, you mean really in person. (laughs) So thank you, listeners, for tuning in once again to Herbally Yours, produced in the studios of 90.3 WHPC, Nassau Community College in Garden City, New York. For further information, email us at whpc at ncc.edu. This is your host, Ellen Kamai at naturalnurse.com, inviting you to join us next week for another edition of Herbally Yours. Until then, stay healthy.